Good afternoon. I'm glad to see you here today. And I'd like to say uh, welcome you on behalf of Historic Northampton. And in partnership with the Smith College History Department, it's my pleasure to welcome you to the sixth lecture and the 350th anniversary lecture series. And I want to point out, as I have before, that these lectures are funded by the Massachusetts Foundation for the Humanities with promotional underwriting from WFCR Public Radio in Western Massachusetts. And uh, we are very fortunate to have the state headquarters of the Massachusetts Foundation for the Humanities as part of the rich cultural life of our community. And we're grateful for their support of this series and for their support of programs of this caliber throughout the Commonwealth. And our representative today from the Massachusetts Foundation of Humanities is Kristen O'Connell. Will you stand and be recognized? Thank you very much for your good work. As I've mentioned in previous lectures, uh, the work at Historic Northampton will not be over at the end of this anniversary year, but we'll be working to sustain the quality of programs like this one for the next generation and for those who will celebrate our 400th anniversary. Today's museums are more than repositories. They're also learning centers. We take that mission very seriously. But we depend on memberships to help defray our operating expenses, and we must grow our membership exponentially if we were to meet the demands of the 21st century. So I invite you to become a member and a supporter of Historic Northampton if you're not. And you can do that very simply by filling out a card at the back of your program and dropping it off at the rear at the table in the lobby. We'll send you information on how to become a friend of Historic Northampton. Or you can send it in on the address of the card. Uh, address on the part of the I also want to remind you that these lectures, along with other articles, will be collected in an anthology published with the University of Massachusetts Press, a place called Paradise Culture and Community in Northampton, Massachusetts, 1654 to 2004. It be published late this year at the close of our anniversary celebration. You can reserve a copy of this book by also filling out the enclosed card in your program. And if you're watching on cable TV, you can call 584-6011 to reserve your copy. This afternoon, Professor Gregory Nobles will explore issues relating to Northampton's role in the American Revolution. Professor Nobles traces the roots of the revolution to economic and social divisions that led to the overthrow of the so-called river gods, the squirearchy that had dominated Hampshire County for a hundred years. Gregory Nobles is professor of history in the School of History, Technology, and Society at Georgia Tech, where he specializes in early American and environmental history. He's the author of Divisions Throughout the Whole, Politics and Society in Hampshire County, Massachusetts, 1740 to 1775. His articles have appeared in journals such as the William & Mary Quarterly, the Journal of Social History, the Journal of American History, and his most recent work is American Frontiers, Cultural Encounters and Continental Conquest. He is currently at work on a book entitled Naturalist Nation, the Art and Science of Birds in Audubon's America. He's held two Fulbright professorships as a senior scholar in New Zealand and as the John Adams Chair in American History in the Netherlands. He's currently a Mellon postdoctoral fellow in the humanities at the Newberry Library in Chicago. And so please join me in welcoming Professor Nobles here today. Thanks very much, uh, especially to Kerry Buckley. Uh, 
and the Northampton Historical Society, uh, to Smith College, and again to the Massachusetts Endowment for the Humanities. The human embodiments of Smith and, and the Mass Historical Society, Mass Endowment, are back there sitting together, so I'll keep an eye on them. <laughs> But I'd also like especially to thank all of you for coming out this afternoon. As I hear you've been doing for this whole lecture series, and I think 13 lectures is a remarkable uh, body of work for people to come and see and to experience and to hear and then, of course, uh, to talk about. So my, my thanks this afternoon is really more than the standard academic throat clearing that I typically do in events like this, because this is a very special place for me. It's wonderful to be, to be back in Northampton, to be back in Paradise. It's been almost uh, 25 years since I left Paradise. It sounds rather Miltonian, doesn't it? Um, but I have very, very good memories of the good old days back in the late 70s when I lived here, uh, when Marsha Burek uh, first brought me here with the opportunity to work on the Sylvester Judd papers at the Forbes Library, uh, when my older daughter was born here at Pooley Dickinson Hospital. And even though she moved away at age two, she still considers herself a Northampton native. Uh, and also back in the 1970s when there were so many good young historians around working on the history of the Connecticut Valley. Uh, we're not so young anymore, but many of us are, are still very much working. It was really quite a terrific time to be here. And there I'm especially glad and, and grateful, very grateful uh, to be here again, to be part of this celebration, commemoration, uh, reconsideration of Northampton's history. I think it's a wonderful idea, and I think it's a way to integrate uh, and to instigate local discussion and conversation, and perhaps even local debate, uh, which, as you see, are some of the issues I'll be talking about uh, this afternoon. So once again, thank you uh, for including me in this, I think, it's really wonderful series. I'm also glad to be back in another way, that is to be back in the 18th century. Uh, as Kerry mentioned, most of my work lately has taken me into the 19th century and away from Western Massachusetts, away from this region, but also away from the American Revolution. And yet in my teaching and my reading, the Revolution is one of those topics I really never become tired of. It's one of those issues that keeps fascinating me as a historian that keeps making me think about some of the most fundamental aspects of political and social life, and in some cases, even very personal life at the individual level. It makes me think about how people choose to make historical change, or how they deal with historical change when it confronts them. About how people face the stakes in their historical situation, and then decide how to act. And I think it's that process of deciding and acting that for me is especially important, especially when I think about people in the past and try to see those people as real human beings. Because it helps me, make, helps me think about myself, ourselves, and the present, and how we decide and act in our historical situation. Now, I'm not, I assure you, going to try to draw some facile parallels between the people who lived in Northampton then and those of us, or perhaps better, those of you who live here now. But I do at least want to ask you to think about their situation at the time of the Revolution, and really to appreciate the difficulty, the intensity of what it was that they were facing at the time. We all have a tendency, I think, to expect our predecessors to be progressive, to be on the right side of the issues, to do the right thing. Because that's how we are, of course. Always consistently and confidently on the right side of the issues. And yet when we look at an event, a phenomenon as historically significant, and I think as historically complicated as the American Revolution, this dramatic process of breaking away from the old and embracing, or indeed even creating, the new, we probably like to think that the people who inhabited this place, this town, some 230 years ago, were in the forefront of that remarkable event, that they rose up almost immediately at all mass. And to use Emerson's words, they were the embattled farmers, or perhaps the embattled farm families, that formed a united front against British tyranny and all other evils, and made a movement for freedom and equality and various other virtues. <laughs> 
That, I think, is the picture we would like to see. But I have to tell you, it didn't happen that way in Northampton. And it didn't happen that way in a lot of other places as well. The coming of the American Revolution to Northampton and to many other communities in western Massachusetts and many other communities in New England and throughout the American colonies did not emerge as an immediate uprising of radical sentiment. Rather, it was a much more complicated, much more contingent phenomenon. A political unfolding, a political faltering even, in some cases. And I think what this coming of the revolution tells us about is the way in which people sometimes make a very awkward approach to great historical moments. Moments that we can see very clearly as we look back to the past, but moments that they at the time could scarcely imagine as they looked into their future. And so this afternoon I'm especially interested in that process of approaching these great moments. That is, not to talk so much about what Northampton did in the Revolution, if we define the Revolution as being the war that begins in 1775. But I want to talk about how Northampton moved into the Revolution in this longer period beforehand, certainly the decade between 1765 and 1775. Now, since we're all here to consider this community, this, this town, to take special note of Northampton, I will cut to the proverbial chase and provide the punchline right here at the outset. The town of Northampton did do the right thing in the Revolution. It did wind up on the right side of the movement. Just not right at first. Not with much communal alacrity. But to understand why, we have to look beyond this town itself to look at the surrounding region and to try to consider the political context, the political culture in which the people of Northampton lived at the time. And how that culture, that context, contributed to the kinds of decisions people made at the time. How they made them, and when they made them. And so we began to look. And as I'll suggest today, also we began to listen. One of the uh, characters I came across in studying Western Massachusetts some years ago was one of those people I'd probably like to invent if he didn't already exist. It was an express writer, a, 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 a news carrier, a mailman, if you will, with a remarkable name of Silent Wild. <laughs> Silent Wild is a wonderful name, and it makes me think, what were his parents thinking when they named him? <laughs> but Silent Wild, both the person and the name, give us a good introduction to this region in the years before the American Revolution. As I noted, Silent Wilder was an express writer who wrote between Boston and the Connecticut Valley in the early 1770s. There you have it. Uh, you can see it. Almost every two weeks or so, Silent Wilder would bring the latest Boston newspapers out here to the western part. And he would sell eight or ten newspapers here in Northampton, maybe another eight or ten up the river uh, in Deerfield. Now, as a former newsboy myself, I can tell you this is not an especially profitable paper route. <laughs> But it's not props I'm interested here, in here, but politics. And I think Silent Wild's rather meager business tells us something about the communication, or perhaps lack of communication, between Boston and the Valley. There we go. The Valley. Zoom in. slowly, and it was actually a little stale by the time it reached Western Massachusetts. And even if we assume that newspapers were passed around from hand to hand, reader to reader, I think we still have to understand that maybe not that many people read the news anyway. There was, of course, this considerable geographic distance between these two parts of Massachusetts, the Bay and the Valley, but I think also a considerable political distance as well. And we might even use Silent Wild's name as a way of defining the difference. And of course, beginning in the middle of the 1760s, political life had begun to seem a bit wild at times in Boston and the certain immediate region around it. 
At the time of the uh, Stamp Act crisis in 1765, the, the, the crowd actions that, that broke out uh, against the persons of property and uh, colonial officials uh, in Boston, or with the non-importation protests in the wake of the Townsend duties in 1767 and 1768, again, another round of protest and disruption. Of course, the so-called Boston Massacre of 1770, and finally, the biggie, the destruction of the tea in Boston Harbor in December of 1773. These are all very familiar, all very faithful seeming events to us now. They've become iconic events in this conflict we now know as the American Revolution. But at the time, they were events that disrupted and redefined the patterns of politics in Boston and in the surrounding region, long before people even knew that there would be a revolution. But if things had become somewhat wild in the eastern part of the province, they remained strikingly silent out here, out here in the west. Those scenes I just showed you were all events, or at least images of events that happened in Boston, but they didn't happen here. Now in 1765, for instance, the time of the Stamp Act, crisis, we find almost no response to the Stamp Act in this part of Massachusetts. There was, yes, a little dust up in Westfield, but that's really about it. Uh, Joseph Hawley, one of the most prominent political figures in Northampton at the time, did speak out and declare that Great Britain, as Hawley put it, had no right to legislate for us with words, but his fellow townspeople in Northampton didn't seem to make much of those words. In 1766, the people of Northampton voted to let Hawley simply to use his best judgment as a representative in the House in Boston, but they didn't offer him any kind of statement of dramatic support. Two years later, in 1768, Joseph Hawley joins other radical leaders in Boston in issuing a circular letter to all the towns in Massachusetts calling for the towns to protest the towns and duties, and then calling for a convention of towns that is, for all the communities in the, in the province to come together to protest the actions of the colony's governor, governor who had already dissolved at that point the general court. But there's this process of political call and response going on between Boston and the rest of Massachusetts, Boston and this part of western Massachusetts. And it turns out to be almost all call from Boston's side and very little response from out here. Just to give you an example, throughout Massachusetts, some 96 towns responded to the, the circular letter calling for this convention of towns. But in Hampshire County, only three towns responded. And only three small and fairly new Hampshire County towns, Brimfield and Montague and Coleraine, all of which were in the larger Hampshire County at the time. Only those three towns dared to send any delegates to this larger convention of towns. The rest of the region remained silent in 1768, silent along with Northampton. In fact, Joseph Hawley's Northampton neighbors voted almost unanimously not to send him or anybody else to be a representative at that convention of towns. And then a few years later, in 1772 and 1773, when the Boston Committee of Correspondence, that radical cadre in the city, again sends out a call for all the towns to come together in common cause, once again, most towns out here fail to respond at all. Throughout Massachusetts as a whole, about half the towns in the province at least answered the Boston Committee of Correspondence. But in Hampshire County, only seven out of the 41 towns wrote back. And again, no, Northampton was not one of those seven. And then finally, in the fall of 1774, when the British-backed government in Boston had been repudiated and seemed essentially to have ceased to exist, the various towns in Massachusetts formed a new political body, a new governing body, called the Provincial Congress. And this time, Northampton did send Joseph Hawley, along with Seth Pomeroy, to represent the town. But in doing so, the town still failed, or perhaps refused, to take an open stand in favor of what the Provincial Congress was going to do. The point is, I find it a very curious situation on the surface. 
Northampton has this very vocal and outspoken and effective leader in Joseph Hawley, but the town itself remains remarkably silent. In fact, let me pause here and say a word about, perhaps really a word for, Joseph Hawley. I think he's an interesting character. And if you attended the earlier lecture on Jonathan Edwards, you've probably already encountered Joseph Hawley, although this is young Joseph Hawley at the time. At the time of the Edwards controversy, Joseph Hawley was this young Yale-educated lawyer who played this very prominent role in helping to oust Edwards from his Northampton pastor in the late 1740s. And then Joseph Hawley went on to carve out a remarkably successful political career, beginning in his late 20s, but serving both in Northampton and representing the town itself at the broader level from the 1740s on through the 1780s, almost without interruption. In fact, I think for almost 40 years, there was nobody who served the town more consistently and more prominently than Joseph Hawley. And by the 1760s, he had become, I think, a significant voice of protest in Boston. Uh, a moderate radical, I like to call him. Uh, not so much a Samuel Adams, but more a John Adams type. In fact, John Adams became Joseph Hawley's very good friend. But on the whole, Hawley was a political figure who carried some weight in Boston and all those political debates taking place at the time. But at the same time, he seemed to carry much less weight here in his hometown of Northampton. Now, part of the problem may have been a, a personal ailment of Hawley. It's a pattern of recurring depression that began in the 1760s. It really dogged him most of the rest of his life, making Hawley at times uh, emotionally isolated and therefore, I think, politically ineffective. And in the world of historical imagination, one has to wonder how Hawley's uh, emotional condition played in the minds of his town people at the time. They repeatedly chose him to represent them, but they also repeatedly failed to give him much back. And one wonders again what a consistently healthy and politically focused Joseph Hawley might have meant, might have done in this period leading up to the revolution here in his hometown. And I think his personal ups and downs offer us one of those intriguing questions about the influence of individuals in local affairs at times of growing political crisis. And again, I think Joseph Hawley is a very interesting figure, uh, maybe underappreciated by his townspeople at the time, certainly, I think, underappreciated by us in the historical profession. I think there's a wonderful project on Joseph Hawley um, yet to be done. And if anybody out in the audience wants to undertake it, I wish you well. And yet, it's not always about individuals. In fact, I think on another level, the real impetus for local political change in the years before the revolution in this part of the province came not so much from any individual leader or a local and regional spokesperson, but really from the common people of the county. And especially those from some of the newer communities that had come into existence in the two or three decades just before the era of the revolution. Here, I think particularly of a place like Pelham, where this opportunity to correspond with the radical leadership in Boston lets us see something of a more general political leadership taking place throughout the region. Just to give you an example, in 1773, the people of Pelham first write back to the Boston Committee of Correspondence. And they began their letter rather tentatively. They said they had, they had considered, to use their word, considered the Boston Committee's warnings. And they were, as they put it, not a little shocked at the attempts on the liberty of America. Still, the Pelham people went on. They wanted to, as they put it, study to be quiet and do nothing rationally. And they also urged other towns to do the same, to have patience in their dealings with the British government. But, they concluded, if being patient and petitioning didn't work, then they would take things to the next level. And the Pelham people say, we trust we shall be wanting in nothing in our power to unite with our dear countrymen for our mutual good. We shall venture our property and our lives as the innate principles of self-preservation and love to our posterity may oblige us. And here you have in 1773, from this hill town here in western Massachusetts, words that almost anticipate the language of the Declaration of Independence. 
The part's about suffering patiently, but then taking action. And about risking lives and fortunes and sacred honor, and so forth. And here we see the people of Pelham rise into this political occasion. And I think what we see is a classic case of a community coming into its own in a time of crisis. And in this case, this small Scots-Irish enclave up in the hills above the valley, where these hard scrabble farmers finally began to discover their own voice, their own political identity. Where the radical leaders in the metropolis call out to them, and they respond. And almost for the first time, they begin taking a look at the wider world beyond their own town and their own region taking a look and taking a stand and searching for the right words and finding those words and speaking out and saying, yes, we're with you in this struggle. And so it was in some of the all other smaller communities in the area. Up the road in Williamsburg, the people told the Boston Committee of Correspondence that they were, as they put it, by all means ready to resist Great Britain, and if you need our assistance in opposing them, we stand ready to grant it according to the utmost of our small capacity. Or in Murrayfield, another new town, the people declared that they were also willing and ready, they said, to assist the town of Boston. Ready for Paul to do it, to defend our rights and privileges, even with the point of the sword. Even with the point of the sword. Those are fighting words. And they're important words for the radical leadership in Boston to hear, because what they're hearing from Northampton and some of the other older and more prosperous towns in this region is nothing. Not a word. From 1772 on through 1773 and into the first half of 1774, through this time of growing crisis and concern, we don't hear a political peep out of Northampton, at least nothing official that goes on the record. And even in the summer of 1774, when the British government punishes Boston and all of Massachusetts for the destruction of tea in Boston Harbor, and when the Boston Committee of Correspondence makes a plea for the towns of Massachusetts to come to the aid of Boston, still nothing comes out of Northampton. I might like to be able to tell you that then in 1774, the people of Northampton were, begin, were busy commemorating their 120th anniversary of the town's founding, that they were at the time listening to lectures and otherwise celebrating their past as you're doing this year, but no, they weren't doing that either. Throughout this period of impending political crisis, Northampton stays off the record and on the sidelines, playing silent and presumably safe. But before you might become a little bit disappointed with the lack of political action among your predecessors, let me say a word about the political context and the political culture in which the people of Northampton lived and operated. I say this not to excuse their apparent reluctance to respond to the calls to action, but simply to explain. First, note that the calls, the political appeals to Boston went out to the towns, not to political parties, not to special interest groups, and certainly not to individuals. There's no mass mailing, no internet at this time. All you have is silent while and people like him are carrying the news back and forth. And this process of writing to towns reflects, on the one hand, of course, uh, the, the way communication worked. But I think it also reflects the way that community worked. In 18th century New England, the town was still the fundamental source of political organization, of political activity. And it was generally assumed that the town would speak as a whole, would speak with one voice. And there was a very strong sense of communal coherence, of, of consensus. This notion that everybody would come to agreement on these most important issues. Now how they did so is an interesting issue in itself. Uh, the final vote, the formal vote, would be taken yes at a town meeting, where only the property holding adult males would have a voice and therefore would have a vote. But of course we assume that people discuss the issue at hand beforehand, and rather extensively and rather widely. Men and women talking in their houses, the street, the tavern, wherever they came together. That these political conversations continued until it was time for the voters then to take some formal stand, to take a formal vote. In many respects, it's not too much different from what we do today. Uh, by the time you get to the ballot box, you probably know how you're going to vote. 
You've discussed it for days, months, perhaps. You've talked with your friends, your family. And your actual vote, your coming to the ballot box or the voting machine is really only the last step in this longer political process that you've been through. And so it was in 18th century Northampton, but with, I think, one significant difference. When you vote today, of course, it's a secret ballot, it's an individual ballot. And when your secret individual ballot gets counted with all the other votes in Northampton, and you certainly hope they do these days, the total is represented as X vote for this and Y votes for that. For instance, uh, I, I happened to check in the 2002 race for representative to the general court uh, in Northampton. 7,149 Northamptonites voted for the Democratic candidate, and 4,090 voted for the Green Party candidate. But you knew that. You know, when I lived here 25 years ago, there were still a few Republicans around. What could you do with them? <laughs> but the point is today that the people in any town, this town, don't always vote the same way. And that's probably good. I mean, we expect to see, we'd like to see division and difference of opinion. But the other point is that in the 18th century, people didn't expect that. They didn't like it. They didn't want division and discord. They had it sometimes, to be sure, but they felt uneasy about it. What they wanted was greater unanimity, the sense of, of the community speaking with one voice. And if the community couldn't speak with one voice, then sometimes it simply stayed silent. And Northampton repeatedly did that during the 1760s and early 1770s. Now, if there's another factor that makes the political culture of this region special, makes it distinctive, it's the presence of a group of very powerful men who have come to be known as the River Gods. Now, I know Kevin Sweeney, my friend Kevin Sweeney, is giving a talk next month about the River Gods, and I certainly don't want to steal his thunder. In fact, I can't. When it comes to the River Gods, Kevin is the River God himself, the River Godfather, perhaps, if you will, and I think you'll see that when he gives his talk next month. But for now, for me, let me just suffice to say that the River Gods were a group of exceedingly powerful men in this region all interconnected by family, by friendship, military service, and money. Men like John Worthington in Springfield, or Jonathan Ashley and his kinsmen up in Deerfield, uh, Solomon Stoddard here in Northampton, and above all, the river god among all river gods, Israel Williams in Hatfield. Men who had favor with the British officials in Boston, men with their hands on the levers of power and patronage in the Connecticut Valley, Men who held enormous political sway throughout the region. Men who had a lot to do with defining the political culture of the region. And men who would decidedly go, maybe have to go, in the first stages of the American Revolution. I, I've been trying to think for a modern analogy of the river gods, how we would define them today. And since I'm living in Chicago at the time being, I'm thinking of Mayor Daly's patronage machine, and it seems to work pretty well. Then my mind drifts off to the Sopranos. I realize it's time to go back to the 18th century for a while. But to illustrate how this political culture worked and how it began to come apart on the eve of the American Revolution, I want to take a local example, tell a, a local story. It's one of my favorite stories and one I think that reveals something very important about the region around here, and I think indirectly about Northampton itself. It's an event that takes place up the road a bit, involving the people of two neighboring towns, Williamsburg and Hatfield. Hatfield, of course, as I mentioned a moment ago, is the hometown of Israel Williams, this, the personal seat of this most powerful man in Hampshire County. So enough said on that, perhaps. Williamsburg, of course, is the town between Hatfield and Northampton. Williamsburg had formerly been a, been a part of Hatfield, and it was a fairly new comparatively recently created community that had been set aside, broken off only a few years before. And it's when the people in the southern part of Hatfield began to petition to become a separate community. They wanted to break away. This is something that happens uh, repeatedly throughout the 18th century. The people in Williamsburg break off, they establish themselves as, as an independent town, and they took, or I think were given, the name Williamsburg for, you guessed it, Israel Williams, or at least for the Williams family. 
Now, Williamsburg, you'll remember I mentioned a moment ago, is one of those few Hampshire County communities that dared to respond to the Boston Committee of Correspondence in 1772 and 1773, when they talked about being, as they put it, by all means ready to resist Great Britain and telling the Boston Committee that if you need our assistance in opposing the British, we stand ready to grant it according to the utmost of our small capacity. And again, brave and, and rousing words from a small and newly independent town. Well, in September of 1774, the people of Williamsburg do indeed begin to exercise, as they put it, the utmost of their small capacity. They go from words to deed, and I think a very daring deed. A group of Williamsburgers in September of 1774, a mob, a crowd, if you will, there are various names we use, a group of Williamsburgers assemble around the town's Liberty Pole, and they're making ready to march on Hatfield. Now, note here the presence of a Liberty Pole in Williamsburg, that, that symbol of defiance and resistance that we find, especially in the eastern part of the province. There's that. Excuse me, why are we, can you straighten this out on your geography here? Yep. We're marching from Williamsburg, which is west of Northampton, all the way to Hatfield, which yes. is across the river. Yeah. 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 Of which they had recently been a corporate part. Dialogue. 
Well, there are two questions that come up immediately at this point in the story. First, what happened next? Did the Williamsburg mob actually get to Hatfield and get their hands on Israel Williams and do something? I don't know. Apparently not. The records are a little conflicted and unclear, and I am sorry for the anti-climax, but I don't want to argue beyond the evidence. But the second question, I think, is even more interesting. If the Hatfield people were themselves so unhappy with this so-called corrupt, vicious crew in their own town, if Williams and his allies really did deserve to be dealt with in severity, perhaps to be whipped, then why didn't the people in Hatfield do it themselves? Why wait for people from the next town over to come do their dirty work? It's a good question. And the answer one Hatfield resident later explained was that taking the action themselves, he said, would break neighborhood. It'd be better to leave this kind of activity first to strangers, that is, to people from outside the town. <coughs> break neighborhood. This is one of my favorite phrases. It's a wonderful phrase. I think it's wonderfully revealing. It tells us that in this town, and I think in other towns as well, there was still this sense of communal cohesion, this sense of living, <coughs> yes, in a neighborhood. Or at least there was some residual respect for the values traditionally assigned to communal cohesion, to neighborhood. Even if the community itself had already become quietly divided. And at the same time, the suggestion that it's better for strangers, people from some other town, to come in and take action also reveals to me that there's a perception, a realization that maybe this neighborhood needed to be broken. That certain powerful people in the community needed to be displaced and again to be dealt with in severity. The point is that strangers, outsiders, coming from the next town over, could apparently do with people the town of the town themselves would not or perhaps could not do. That is to take direct action against their own local townspeople, their own neighbors, no matter how noxious those neighbors might have become. And that's what happens in the summer of 1774 and the fall of 1774 and on into the winter of 1775. People from the surrounding towns throughout this region go into other towns and take action. They break neighborhood in neighborhoods that are perhaps waiting to be broken. Not just in Hatfield, but in other significant towns in Hampshire County, in Hampshire County including here in Northampton. In August of 1774, several thousand people from all over Hampshire County converge upon Springfield. And they're there to stop the county court from sitting. And they call out the justices one by one, and they question them about their loyalty to the crown and to their country. Loyalties that are, at that point, are getting increasingly hard to fit together. And the crowd insists that these justices renounce their commissions from the king well, Israel Williams happens to be one of the justices. He tries to go out and argue that he supports the people in their common cause, but of course nobody really believes it. A few months later, in February of 1775, after Williams had been challenged by the mob in Springfield at the court, after the, the Williamsburg people had almost come to get him in Hatfield, the people from Pelham did come and get him. It's one of the most famous acts of ritual retribution in Hampshire County history. The people from Pelham capture Israel Williams and his son. They take them over to Hadley, put them in a house with a clogged chimney, and smoke them there overnight. That seems to do it for Israel Williams. Soon after that, the people of Hatfield, his own town, put him under a kind of close supervision, eventually a house arrest. And they keep him there under surveillance throughout the revolution. They even deny him communion in church. And Israel Williams complains bitterly about what he calls the darts and daggers thrown in the dark, that is, the, the, the cheap shots, if you will, that he felt that he had suffered at the hands of his Hatfield neighbors. But they had broken neighborhood by that point, and they had broken the <coughs> The same mob that smokes Israel Williams, this mob from Pelham, then comes to Northampton, and here their target is Solomon Stoddard, the grandson of the great Northampton minister, and again, a close ally of Israel Williams and the River Gods. And the Pelham mob captures Solomon Stoddard, but because Stoddard's in poor health at the time, they spare him the smoking they'd given Israel Williams, and they only insist that he sign a confession and repent of his political sins. 
The Reverend Jonathan Judd, looking on from the perspective of his pastor in Southampton, comments that the Pelamites, he says, act like mad people, though well for a mob. Well, whether they acted well or not, the mob from Pelham acted effectively. And like the mob from Williamsburg, they served to break the neighborhood in a way that the Northampton and Hatfield locals had not done themselves, or at least had not yet done themselves. And then soon after the Pelham people come to Northampton to seek out Solomon's daughter, the newly formed Committee of Safety in Northampton then takes daughter to the town jail. And along with several other suspected Tories in this town, Timothy Dwight, Gideon Clark, Haynes Kingsley, they're incarcerated. And so it went elsewhere throughout the county. Prominent leaders in prominent towns were unseated. They were subjected to abuse and in some cases even arrest. Initially by outsiders, these so-called strangers from other towns, but then by their own townspeople, by their own neighbors. So what do we make of this, this seemingly sudden transformation from comparative political silence to this decisive political action? I'd argue that the action helps us understand the silence better. That is, this apparently sudden political transformation in a town like Northampton may not have been so sudden after all. That political and again, perhaps personal resentments had been festering beneath the surface for years. And when they came in, into the larger political context of the early 1770s, they began to take on a different look. And above all, the coming of these nearby strangers, whether they be from Williamsburg or Pelham or wherever, caused these resentments suddenly to become more politically immediate and perhaps politically legitimate. Or to put it differently, perhaps Northampton's apparent silence on these important political issues in the late 1760s and early 1770s the town's failure to respond to the repeated appeals of the Boston Committee of Correspondence in 1768, 1772, even 1774, when crisis was all but inescapable. This town's failure to give vocal support to a political leader like Joseph Hawley was maybe not just a sign of distance or indifference. Not even, I think, a sign of conservatism if we take conservatism to mean opposition to this growing radical cause. I think it's more complicated than that. It's a sign of caution, to be sure, but also, I think, a sign of concession to certain standards of political culture. Standards that still emphasize collective cohesion and political consensus. Standards of speaking with one communal voice or, again, remaining silent. But once the local silence had been broken, once the local neighborhood had been broken, it may seem striking how quickly things change here in Northampton. This town has been so reticent, maybe so reluctant, in answering the call of the Boston Committee of Correspondence, organizes its own Committee of Correspondence, finally. The militiamen join other county militias. They renounce the leadership and authority of the old county militia leaders, Israel Williams and his allies and they form local companies of Minutemen. And then in April of 1775, after the alarm comes from Lexington and Concord, these Minutemen companies do, in fact, march eastward, and they join this growing rebel army outside Boston and Cambridge. And they stay there. They stay there through the summer of 1775, through the Battle of Bunker Hill, although the Northampton troops never got involved in the fighting, but they were there. They were there. And then in January of 1776, the Northampton's militiamen come home. And from then on, Northampton began to look a lot like other New England towns. Northampton plays what I would call a respectable role in the revolution. I'll be happy to discuss that in more detail later. But again, the role that Northampton plays in the revolution, in the war, may not be the most important point here. Again, I think it's the way Northampton moved into the war, into the revolution, that may be even more striking, maybe even more significant in the longer history of this town. And I think 
Those of us looking back at the people of this community at that time have to be impressed with the risks that they took, even though they seemed so quiet. Not just the external risks of facing their government, the economic and military power of Great Britain, and not just the risk of breaking this long political tradition that had held them together with Great Britain, but they're also taking significant internal risks of facing their own neighbors, breaking their own local political traditions, breaking, again, neighborhood. And that might have been the most difficult break of all. And as we look, or indeed as you look, at the longer history of Northampton in this lecture series, I think we'll hear, and you've probably already begun to hear, many voices in this town's past over the course of its history. Northampton does not often remain silent, nor does it speak only with one voice. Especially as we move into the 19th century, we begin to hear many different voices in Northampton, many dissonant voices here, some of them defined by political parties, some defined by class, gender, race, ethnicity, and all those other divisions, all those other kinds of voices that we still hear today. And yet I think it's the ability of those voices to speak, not just to speak, but to be heard and to be listened to as part of this community conversation, is something that traces its roots back to this period of apparent quiet just before the revolution. Now I want to be clear, the revolution did not bring an immediate or dramatic or complete transformation in this community conversation. But it began to open that conversation up. It began to encourage people, require people, to reconsider, I think, to renegotiate what it meant to be part of a town, what it meant to be part of a community, what it meant to be part of a neighborhood. And I think that reconsideration, that renegotiation, is part of an ongoing conversation, maybe one that will never end. In fact, maybe 350 years from now, in some future lecture series in this town, we'll contemplate the long, then 700-year history of this place. And maybe people then will hear the voices that are part of the community conversation today. Maybe they will hear your voices. We can only hope. In the meantime, I think that's reason enough for us to keep talking. And at this point, I am going to stop talking, open this session to you, to a wider conversation that it voices that it engages your voices in a conversation about this town. But thank you very much for listening. opens the door, releases some opportunities for other people to take actions that they might not have been so willing 
uh, to do for him. So yes. Yes. I'd also like to suggest that one of the reasons why there is this silence, this hesitation, uh, this uneasiness about breaking the neighborhood, is that Northampton had been through this yeah. at the time of yeah. Jonathan Edwards. I mean, right. the neighborhood was broken, mm -hmm. yeah. and they had history, knew the cost, mm -hmm. and were reluctant to go there again. I think you're exactly right, and the Edwards case is, is quite often in the back of my mind when I think about Northampton. Um, they were barely two decades away from that local crisis. Um, and I think that, that once Edwards is uh, ousted, expelled, encouraged to move elsewhere, call it what you will, um, that there is a sense of trying to come back together a, a, as a community. Um, and I think that also what is, is very important there uh, and again, it's not that we don't see conflicts and divisions and, 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 and local crises in towns. But I think what happens is there's a sense that if you have this kind of conflict, if you have this kind of local division, that there's something wrong. That there's something wrong with you as a community. You're not supposed to do this. And when you do it, whether you expel Jonathan Edwards, or indeed you have expulsions of ministers throughout parts of Hampshire County in these years before the revolution. It's something that, 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 that people sometimes feel is necessary, maybe even, I think in the case of Northampton, to redefine what the community was, to get rid of this man who had become this kind of uh, very disturbing presence here. Um, and once that's done, then to reunite with a sense that perhaps we shouldn't have done that, and perhaps we'll think twice before we do it again. And yet I think that what happens begins to happen um, in the revolutionary era, is this, this, this notion that, that somehow to divide a community, to break a neighborhood, as it were. Um, not that it suddenly becomes uh, an altogether acceptable thing, but it begins to become less unacceptable. And I think what we see beginning in the revolutionary era and on into the 19th century, uh, and again, is not a sudden dramatic transformation, but I think it's, it's a process whereby these old standards of uh, communal harmony, of speaking with one voice began to erode, and people began to discover different voices, multiple voices, competing voices. And they become reflected, I think, in the political behaviors um, and political conversations of these communities. Here's a question, yes. I guess I'm still confused about the relationship between the Northampton Council and the local power of the river god and the repudiation when it comes. Yeah. Which, as far as I take it, I'm not talking about political uh, having to do with revolution, yeah. or whether we're now beginning a social change mm -hmm. in terms of property. I take it your uh, power is poverty. Uh, it's, but there's something else that's happening yeah. that brings about this repudiation yeah. outside of maybe breaking neighborhood. Yeah, yeah. But what's really doing that? Well, first of all, I, I have to finish my disclaimer. I should leave all this to Kevin Sweeney, but I won't, uh, since he's not here. Um, I think that what you find at the, the coming of the revolution, that is, these years right before the outbreak of, of military action, um, is a growing set of, or a converging set, I should say, of tensions. Some of them that speak to the larger imperial issue, some of them that, 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 that might stretch across the Atlantic, some of which are very, very close to home. But I think if you're a, a, a common citizen living in this region in, say, 1770, and you understand the power that Israel Williams and his allies have, power, yes, of property, power of patronage, influence, political power, military power, I mean, they run the county militia. It's a dangerous act to challenge them, very dangerous. And yet, what I've seen in looking at this region at the time of the revolution is that you have this growing uh, provincial or indeed imperial crisis that converges and maybe even provides a kind of local cover for carrying out some of these other uh, rejections, other breaks uh, in the neighborhood. Uh, to go after Israel Williams in 1760, 1765, uh, would have been dangerous. To do so in 1774, 1775, 
is becoming less so because there's this larger, larger mobilization, not just in Northampton or Hatfield or Williamsburg, but in, in, in throughout Hampshire County, indeed throughout the province, throughout all of New England. And people who have become identified, who are identified with the, the status quo, the, the, the ruling power, if you will, become targets. One, for very good political reasons that you can talk about, and two, for longer standing economic and local reasons that perhaps you don't want to talk about as much. And this is why I think when, when, when uh, Benjamin Reed is, is threatening to bring his people to Williamsburg, he's quizzed by Israel Chapin, the constable. Are you coming to rectify, rectify private damage relative, relative to an old difficulty? And if you are, that may not be too legitimate. But if you're coming for political reasons, then come right in. But I think those two get very much conflated. Yes? Uh, there was a book written by the University of Manhattan professor about Daniel Shea. And yes. And from that impression, I got, as you said right here, that I think it was a thing in the family of one or two families that accounted for 25 percent of the men who made up the volunteers for Daniel Shea. Yeah. And that had to do with two, two things to the contrary. One was that up in the hill, they had these one or two acres, small farms with rocks and so forth. Yep. It was a different type of farming yep. that we had down here in the valley in North Hampton. Yep. And therefore, there were uh, two, two reasons why. One of the families were seemed to be more coherent up in the hills. And secondly, we had a different geographical setting down here. There are numerous ways to explain the coming of Shays Rebellion. Uh, you can look at it in terms of uh, Residents, you know, geographical, you can look at it in terms of um, class, uh, access to political uh, office, political power. You can look at it in terms of kinship. And yet I think also, when you look at, at, at Shade Rebellion, um, I'm, I'm still struck by the way in which that movement organizes itself within or around communities. Some of them, Northampton, of course, being a very uh, conservative community at that point, but the people from uh, the town I like a lot, Helm, uh, still are a very uh, radical and active community. Uh, and I think that, that again, um, people draw a certain kind of strength, a certain kind of uh, political power to mobilize from uh, being in concert with others, living with others. And yeah, Helm is a very different kind of town. Uh, Farms a little bit larger than that. I actually wrote an article on this. But it's not a whole lot, uh, and it's not a prosperous uh, existence up in Pelham. And you, they look down the river, they look down into the valley, and they see Northampton, a place like this, and it's a very different kind of situation. Not to say that everybody in Northampton is prosperous, they're not. But I think it's, it's the, the image of the community. So as we try to take apart Shays Rebellion, which I think is actually a, a lot more complicated than the American Revolution, because it is so local, and it, it, it in many cases defies our predictive powers. Uh, and yet I think that as you look at things like kinship, community, um, social class, economic status, that kind of thing, you begin to find layers and layers that, that make it a fascinating topic uh, for all of us. Yes? You focus one community all these people marching together, and you talk about No, the constables were local. People like Israel Chapin, who's uh, you know a, a, a town official, and somebody's coming to town, he goes out to meet them. Uh, but you know he, he's not really backed by, uh, at least directly backed by the power of the British government. Uh, as I point out, he's a local who, who's in a sense doing his job, enforcing the if not the law, the the, the standards of the community. But clearly he has his own grievances too. And when he finds out that these people might be coming to do some of the kind of work that he would like to see done in his own town, then he is willing to stand aside uh, and let them in. And even suggest that his own people might join in. But law enforcement is a very localized uh, affair, and there's not a, a kind of um, provincial wide uh, um, what, state patrol or something like that, that kind of thing. Um, Everything is local. 
And uh, yeah, there's a local militia, I mean a county militia that's governed by the Israel Wings and others. But that's called out in times of, of real crisis. Uh, if you're living in a, a particular community, Northampton, Bellamy, whatever it might be, um, then whatever law enforcement, as we would know it, is done simply by, again, one of your neighbors. Yes, okay. uh, The uh, European Union is expanding and uh, redefining itself. Uh -huh. And uh, commentators have said that uh, this is something entirely new. Uh, but I'm wondering if you could draw any parallels between uh, the formation of the Union and uh, the formation of the United States uh, over a period of decades. Mm -hmm. and, and the EU. Yeah. Okay. Oh. Uh, there's an unanticipated question. <laughs> no, I, I do think um, it's very interesting when um, the, the people in Northampton were considering the federal constitution. They wrote to the two men who were going to represent them at the Massachusetts Convention. Each state, of course, had to ratify the constitution, and, and in Massachusetts it was a very, very close vote. Uh, 19 votes had it gone, 10 the other way, you know, who knows. Um, but the people of Massachusetts, of Northampton, wrote to their delegates and they said, be not only local in your point of view, think about the nation, or think about this, this larger federation. And the point is, they were beginning to take a new frame of reference, not just the, uh, um, the first wild map I had up on there, not just Northampton, not just Hampshire County, but beginning to, to think in much larger terms. Um, and so I think that as people began, today we talk about you know, doing things on a, on a global scale. Uh, in their case, they were talking about doing things on a, a regional and national, and maybe a transatlantic scale, as we think about the larger Atlantic world. Um, and I think that, that there is this kind of um, uh, shift of thinking, uh, maybe shift of economic engagement, that helps propel this. People become uh, more global in their thinking as they become, or at least they hope to become, more global in their uh, in, in their problem. There's another question right here. Yes. Um, how significant is the power of the government? Oh, dramatically. Um, Razor Woods, he died uh, during the revolution. Ultimate altering. Uh, no, that they were they were in a sense uh, deposed. That whole uh, network of power that they had established, and that had been blessed by the British government, or at least the uh, the representatives of the British government in Boston, there was this, this rather large patronage network that ran from uh, Great Britain through Boston <coughs> through Hatfield up, up the valley. Uh, when the source of that patronage was uh, rejected, when the government in Boston was rejected when Williams and his allies in this local area uh, were very soundly rejected, and in some cases incarcerated, or in Williams' case, put under house arrest. Um, they had no power, uh, they had no political credibility. And they did not, at least convincingly, uh, tell their, their neighbors that they had somehow turned and got their minds right. They were disgraced. And Williams uh, died in I think it was 1788, I have to check that. But uh, he lived the rest of his life um, as a, a, a disdained man in his, own, in his own community. Unable to leave, and really unable to live, I think, in that community. Um, yes, thank you. Um, I'm 
not a great difference between those who might be <coughs> uh, among the town's uh, least wealthy inhabitants and the most wealthy. And so I think that there is a kind of, um, a, again, a kind of rough equality, a sense of that we are all more or less in the same boat. And I don't think their, their desire really was to take anything, uh, at least directly from Williams and, and others like that. But it was, I think, to, uh, to, to break the power uh, and to get these heavy hands uh, you know, off the county, therefore off them. There was a question. Uh, I had, uh, I have uh, forebears who were in the Connecticut Valley at the time of the revolution and prior to that. One of them was a lieutenant colonel, colonel militia in Greenfield. His name was David Wells. Mm -hmm. He went to uh, Arizona and uh, right. Ticonderoga with uh, the regiment. Uh, one of his, uh, I think, his brother or, or someone close relative was killed in Bunker Hill. Uh, my impression is that, that there wasn't any uh, reluctance to get involved in the, in the uh, development of the revolutionary movement up there, and I haven't researched it. Mm -hmm. I'm interested in what was, what was the relationship between the, the uh, communities to the north, such as and Rock in that period, and where, where they were uh, aggressive, uh, aggressively uh, involved in, in the development of the revolution than the people here were? Well, I think if we look at, at this part of the world as being comparatively quiet, there were a few vocal communities. And, and again, my, my uh, uh, argument would be that the, uh, it's a little bit easier for some of the newer uh, communities that are less uh, integrated with, uh, dependent upon the county power network, that are able and perhaps more eager uh, to, to speak out, speak their minds. You find much more uh, open agitation in Greenfield than you do just a little bit over in Deerfield, which is again one of those rather uh, conservative enclaves in, in, in the revolution, or at least in the years before the revolution. And I think it, it, to some degree, and I don't want to overstate this, but I think it, it's the absence of um, these, this, uh, um, this, this political network in one's own community. Everybody's aware of who the, the so-called murder gods are. You know, they're inescapable. But I think that they are, uh, it, they become easier to, to challenge, easier to disparage if you're not directly, or at least so directly dependent on it, if you don't see them in your community, or indeed um, in your neighborhood. And again, I, I don't want to um, begin to uh, sort of creep over into Kevin Sweeney's uh, turf for uh, the next in the next month, but I think that the kinds of questions you're asking at this point uh, are exactly the kinds of questions he'll talk about on a much larger uh, chronological scale next time. Yes. Yeah, uh, my question is about how Laura basically answers, but the other question is just about the physical nature of communication. These few newspapers which will run every week between the Boston and the Valley, would that news then be picked up and recirculated widely within the community? And was all of this done just by one individual on horseback and coming up the river on a or something? How is it done physically? Well, no, I think that Silent Wild, this man whose uh, name I love so much, um, was not the only one. But there was not a, 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 an extensive mail delivery, newspaper delivery system out to this part of the world, uh, even in this time before, uh, immediately before the revolution. I mean, I see references as I look at the, at the local records about people, um, you know, communicating back and forth between towns, and we have to imagine sometimes that's carried by one town resident to the next town, maybe to a friend, a uh, 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 Kendall. Um, sometimes people like Silent Wild um, you know, are in the business to carry the news. But when we think about the communication networks we have now, or even that this region began to have in the early part of the 19th century, you know, with regular mail service, it didn't exist. It didn't exist. And I think that, that communication uh, was very much a kind of uh, catch as catch can uh, process. Yeah, there were some scheduled deliveries, but they were infrequent. Uh, they were not uh, extensive, and I think that one of the things for us here in the now 21st century uh, to try to imagine 
as we depend so uh, incessantly on instant access, is the way in which communication was rather sporadic. Uh, and, and, and how that affected people's thinking, their awareness of what's going on. People in this region did know what was going on in Boston. They didn't get it the next day, but they did get it. And then one of the questions is, they still, in many cases, remain silent once they heard it. And it's that silence, I think, that I'm interested in as much as the, the communication. Sir? Yes, Karen. Uh, I wonder if you could just sort of uh, encapsulate uh, North Hampton's role during the conflict, because I don't believe that other lectures overlap that. During the, the, the conflict, the war. Yeah, okay. Uh, very quickly, uh, as I said, North Hampton did a respectable, <coughs> had played a respectable role in the revolution. Um, as soon as the Lexington Concord alarm uh, came, they mobilized, went off to uh, do their duty in Boston. They stayed there. Uh, then they came back, and then Northampton, the people of Northampton, did what most other New England communities did. They kind of waited out the war. Uh, as you look at the muster rolls uh, from Northampton, you'll find that in any given year, any given month, there are a few uh, typically young men going off to serve for a few months, three months, maybe six months, uh, either in a militia company or sometimes later in the war in the Continental Army. There are two moments when there's a real spike in Northampton's military activity. In 1777, during the Saratoga campaign, when the British are coming down Vermont and into eastern New York, and suddenly they're very close to home. They're too close for comfort. There's a remarkable upsurge of mobilization in Northampton as people go off and, and do their duty uh, to help uh, resist uh, General Burgoyne. The same thing happens in 1779. There's a, a British raid or threats of a British raid on Connecticut. And again, when the war seems to come home or come close, people then mobilize because they are protecting their own lives, their own families, their own farms and communities. But what happens overall during the war, and not just in Northampton, but throughout most of England communities, is that as the war, the military part, the military theater begins to move south, first to Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and then by 1780 down to the Carolinas and Georgia. Uh, many New Northamptonites, and indeed most New Englanders, are very happy simply to let the war go. You find some people from the community serving, but by and large, uh, they, they've done their bit, they've defended their region, and unless there's some immediate threat, uh, here they stay. What they're called upon to do otherwise is to provide uh, requisitions of clothing, uh, supplies, uh, occasionally arms and ammunition, uh, and they do that. And again, Northampton provides that kind of uh, support role. It's ravaged by uh, smallpox in 1777, which is another complication on the local scene. Um, but I think that um, you know, if, if we're looking uh, at the American Revolution and expecting to see a kind of massive mobilization that lasts for months and years, rather like, I don't know, World War II. We don't see that here, but you don't see it anywhere. In many respects, the American Revolution is a, a series of local uh, mobilizations, local conflicts, and it's fought by people in the region where the British happen to be at that time. Uh, yes? Well, they were farmers. I mean, when they went, if they were they left in large numbers, yeah. Uh, the women folk took care of the home front, yeah. and so they couldn't afford to lose those uh, leaders of the family. Yeah. So while fighting a the war, they had to provide at home, too. Sure. Actually, uh, there's a wonderful historian, John Shy, who's done rather extensive studies of uh, military units, both in New England and elsewhere. And what he points out is that it's very exceptional for somebody to go off and serve long term as a soldier. Uh, most people try to go off for an immediate alarm uh, for a couple of months and they come back home because in fact they are by and large farmers. Uh, and that's where their, their wherewithal is. Um, and you know, if we think about the embattled farmers that Emerson talks about, yes they are, but not for long. And to serve in the military, to be a, 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 almost a, a quasi-professional soldier, is very much the exception. 
And quite often, those professional or semi-professional soldiers are disdained by their uh, fellow Americans. Wait, wait here. Seeing arms, um, what did you see the economy at that time? I mean, I've done a little bit of work on this, yeah. and clearly, it's not a cash economy we have today. And no. thinking about silence, thinking about um, breaking the neighborhood, you know, the kitchen ties that existed. Clearly, I mean, I've seen accountants in that period. Mm -hmm. All those credits, debts, you know, with one individual and one individual account both with lots of folks. Um, um, and in some ways, I, you know, um, this is another factor of those kinds of relationships that maintain that was the reason for um, maintaining on that rate of neighborhood. Um, mm -hmm. I wonder if you can comment on that. Yeah. Well, the local economy uh, and the, the way in which the local economy operates uh, has been one of those issues that, that really engaged historians, uh, especially during the 1970s, early 1980s, as they tried to, uh, I say they, we, uh, I, uh, tried to look at uh, the ways in which uh, the, the, the presence, or really more often the absence of what you and I would call cash, you know, circulating money, uh, how that played such a diminished role uh, in the economy. This was an economy built upon credit. Sometimes credit and faith, uh, a very face-to-face -face kind of relationship, and quite often one that of, course, that, of course, operates on a seasonal basis. If you're a farmer, you go to a county store, and you begin to you, you get goods with a promise that you will pay off either in, maybe in money, but more likely in, in farm products, or occasionally in labor or the labor of your son. Um, and I think that, that uh, and again, I, uh, I will plug uh, David Zattery's book on Shay's Rebellion. Uh, Zattery has rather a long discussion of how this, uh, this, this uh, kind of local credit economy becomes uh, squeezed, crushed, by uh, this credit squeeze that takes place in the years just after the revolution. It's always, it's always a very kind of fragile economy. <laughs> Because it's, it's not the kind of cash and credit card economy that, that, that we live. Yes, ma'am. I'm excited about something that continues to this day. Um, it's called the Thank you. 
soldier who rises up, as opposed to the professional soldier, which is the image that they had about the, uh, the hirelings from Great Britain. And when Washington was trying to fight a war, he was also trying to fight this hostility toward his own army. Because to the extent that they seemed like a professional army, a standing army, they seemed completely antithetical to everything that a lot of people thought they were fighting for. And so you have this, this, this curious contrast. How do you fight a standing army when your own people don't support your own attempt to create an equal force? It makes, I think, the, the, the outcome, the military outcome of the revolution, uh, remarkably dramatic. Yes? If I might just put on your response to Jen, we already had our big thing on here. It's called the Qual, and the water didn't go to us, it went to Boston. <laughs> <laughs> no hard feelings, though. <laughs> Actually, yeah, I, I was out in, in Pelham one time in Daniel Shea's house is now, I think, just on the edge of the quad where I was almost got it. So. Thank you very much.